Um, welcome to review session two. Okay, and um, I was happy to see that um, there was good attendance to review session one and uh, seemingly um, good use of the recording as well. Um, and uh, I hope that's been helpful for your uh, review for this class. That review session did contain uh, the large majority of um, the material that it seems to me necessary to review uh, for this class. Um, however, um, in the past week, uh, uh, despite my being focused uh, predominantly on, on um, personal matters in the holiday, uh, I did uh, have a chance to reflect some. And I realized that there were uh, some gaps uh, in that. Um, I'm identifying these gaps having not yet finalized, I might note, the, uh, the final set of, of questions to deliver. Um, I'm uh, going back and forth on a, on a set of them. And um, uh, none of this specifically reflects the exact knowledge of what's in the uh, exam contents, because that isn't yet fully 100% determined uh, that will be obviously at this time. Now, um, uh, however, the, the material that I admitted was important enough that uh, I thought it was really worthwhile to go over uh, some of it. So um, uh, I had noted as well uh, that we have um, uh, only a limited time tonight, only about half the time less that we we had last time so um my plan is to avoid um you know going over all the material rather focus on these areas where i think there were gaps and then as time allows um open the floor to questions um now uh i did want to say that i uh during my holiday and and in fact this weekend i have been uh back and forth with the tas and uh it was my understanding from them that um, all the marking had been finished with the exception of the take home exercise, which I think was being worked on today. But um, in any case, I'm monitoring that situation closely and um, hopefully by, you know, by at the latest uh, tomorrow morning, everything should be uh, in place. So apologies for the, for the, the delay on that. Okay. So uh, with that said, I'm going to switch over to some slides. It seems that people are no longer pouring in at the, uh, at the, the rate they were earlier. So I'm going to just see if we can get some of these slides up that, that highlights uh, these gaps. Okay, so uh, broadly speaking, whoa. That's not what I wanted. Um, broadly speaking, there were um, two um, two areas where I thought the the coverage in the um, uh, in the exam review session uh, didn't match the uh, significance of certain um, broad areas, and um, uh, one of them. Uh, concern some of the building blocks of system dynamics at higher levels than just stocks and flows to wit. Things like first order delays, competing risks, and uh, the sort of uh, oscillatory dynamics that can come out of uh, delayed feedbacks. Um, those were all things uh, that we discussed and I wanted to we discussed in class, but I, I, I didn't feel that I had um, emphasized some aspects of them um, enough. Uh, the second broad set of things is to distinguish um, three each quite important notions of dimension, where the term dimension comes up in the context of dynamic modeling. Um, all three of these apply to all three of the modeling types. The, these concepts are important uh, and, uh, and they are uh, particularly important in terms of understanding the relationship of the model to 
to external data and, and empirical data in, in at least uh, one of those cases. Um, and I felt I had uh, done a disservice actually on all three because I, I hadn't sufficiently emphasized uh, the role um, these, these play in, uh, in our reasoning during the review session. So um, I will now um, proceed to, to talk about uh, these gaps. Uh, nothing which I said earlier on the exam structure is any different um, um, and certain things are still outside the exam um, sphere. The same things are outside the exam sphere as articulated last time. Okay, now um, uh, the optics of this are, are not good. I, I seem to have a uh, severely, um, uh, severely overexposed uh, cranium um, I'm glad I wasn't bald or I might have made you blind. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to, to go in and talk about, again, two major of these items. Um, it's not that they were omitted entirely last time, but I, I didn't do them justice. So the first has to do with system dynamics. And um, causal diagrams, uh, this, is, this is really uh, shouldn't have, have stuck there. It was kind of vestigial from a previous exam session, um, in a previous session of the course. Um, but basically with stocks and flows, you should be rock solid on um, uh, the structures associated with them, behavior. Um, really understand first order delays quite inside out. Um, that's a strong expectation. They are the sort of higher level building blocks out of which we build these larger models. And things like competing risks, aging chains, and, and these delayed feedbacks, you should be uh, comfortable on. Now, we went into some of these things last time, at, at least uh, in brief, but I, I wanted to highlight a, a couple features of them. Um, so um, we're dealing here with a first order delay where we have some outflow and potentially some inflow, otherwise it's defined as an inflow of zero um, magnitude. Uh, and this first order delay can be expressed in one of two different ways, um, with a probability per unit time alpha of proceeding from the stock onwards, or as a mean time in the stock, call it tau, um, which is expressing the same concept just with the, um, in terms of a, of a time, a residence time rather than a probability Per unit time of advancing. Uh, and there's a couple questions um, that come up in this. Uh, one is, you know, sort of what's the mean time someone spends in the stock? You have a chance per unit time of, of leaving alpha. Uh, that's one question. Another question is, uh, what's the value of the stock at which the system's in equilibrium? A third question might be, what's the value of the flow, the outflow at which the system is in equilibrium? And uh, you need to be conversant in, in all those questions um, and, and be able to do so regardless of how we phrase this particular first order delay in terms of uh, mean time alpha, uh, mean time resonance time tau, or in terms of uh, probability per unit time of advancing alpha. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just a pointer. The, the, key, the key intuition to have here is a system like this always wants to reach a point where it's in equilibrium. It's stability seeking. It aches for stability. It yearns for the stability. And what is the stable state for this system? What's the state in which it's in balance? It's the state where outflow equals inflow. If outflow is less than inflow, the state, the system, the number of people in the unimaginably named people stock will be rising. If the outflow is greater than the inflow, it'll be dropping and it won't be in equilibrium. It's in equilibrium, it's in balance if outflow equals inflow. So you have 10 people per day leaving, 10 people per day coming in. Um, and that's the goal that this system tries to reach. Okay, that's, that's where it's going. Obviously, if the inflow is zero, that means it wants to get into a state where nobody's in that stock, where it's being drained, right? And it just drains down to zero. If 
but in general wants inflow equals outflow. Um, that's the general case. And um, in this case, there's going to be, you know, a, a rock solid rule that you can depend on that um, in that equilibrium state, des equal, you know, or outflow equals inflow. That's what it wants. Now, the value of the stock at which that is true will depend on the formula for the outflow, right? And um, we'll, we'll go through a little bit of it. So, you know, here we have flow rates and, and this is, you know, in quite uh, atrocious formatting. So let me see if I can remediate the damage a little bit. Um, here we go. So here we're showing a graph of a situation in which there's no inflow until time 50. And then suddenly, bam, the inflow goes up to 20 per, in this case, per year. Okay. Um, and what we're showing here is the outflow. It's this death flow. And so you could see the system respond to this. As soon as the inflow rises, you know, the outflow has been zero as well. And then suddenly, tons of people coming in. So today the stock will rise and that will dry, drive this outflow, you know, to rise similarly. And the system is going to go either quickly for a, a high value of alpha or slowly for a low value of alpha. Um, the system is going to head, start heading towards this point that it wants to reach where outflow equals inflow. Um, and what we're showing here is the flow. So it's going towards a state where the outflow is equal to the inflow, which is now 20 after that, okay? Uh, and these are just different lengths of time. Um, now, uh, there's, um, as I said, there's two different ways of phrasing this. One with a mean time in the stock, tau, let's call it, and the other with a probability per unit time of advancing realize that the mathematics associated with them are, if you look below the surface, fundamentally the same. For a, for a first order delay articulated in this way that we're seeing on the screen, the outflow is equal to the product of this probability per unit time in the population. Uh, and so death is equal to alpha times population. And in this other case, the mean lifetime, by contrast, it's population divided by the mean lifetime. Okay, now, um, you know, a couple of points on this. It has, students, students get confused about this quite a lot and they substitute one for the other. Look, just, just remember, and this is an important point. It's going to link into my second major topic in a few minutes that I'm going to broach, which is on dimensions. If you have a system and you have a stock, the inflows and outflows from that stock have to have a dimension of whatever the dimension of the stock is, in this case, persons, divided by time. It's persons per unit time for the inflow and the outflow. It's gotta be the case because the stock is the integral of it times. So you sum it up, you sum the value of the inflows times dt and, and you're multiplying it by a time and you're summing it up. And so it's, it's, it's gotta, gotta be summing up things that are of the same dimension as, as the stock. Okay, as the state variable there. So given that, given that we know the flow has to have a dimension of dimension of the stock divided by time, there's only one formula you can give here and that's population divided by tau because tau is of dimension time. It's a mean like amount of time. So it's dimension time. So the only formula we can give that'll be dimensionally consistent, dimensionally homogeneous as we'd say, or dimensionally um, correct would be uh, death equals population divided by mean lifetime. By contrast, for mortality rate, the dimension of this is one over time, okay? It's, you could think of it as a probability 
per unit time. So the denominator, the per means there's a denominator, there's a numerator. The denominator is time, it's per unit time. And the numerator is a probability, which is like number of heads divided by number of coin flips total. So it's dimensionless, it's, it's unit dimension. We'll come back to that later. And so th this alpha has a unit of one over, or a dimension of one over time. Okay, um, it's a per unit time. Um, you could think of it as what fraction of the people come per unit time. If you, if you like think about a fraction as dimensionless. You know, the fraction of the floor that in this room that's occupied by furniture holds the same regardless of whether I measure, measure things in square meters or square feet. It doesn't care, it's a fraction. Um, it's a fraction of the surface area that's covered by furniture, okay. So it doesn't care about my units, so it's dimensionless. That's why it's in the numerator of dimensionless, one over time. And so look, if this is uh, dimension one over time and you have population, which is dimension people and death, the formula for death has to be something that's people per unit time. Oh, you, you, the only thing it can be is population times alpha. That's what it's gotta be. And so death has to be, the formula for death has to be alpha times population. And if you always come back to this, and it's particularly easy to do in your head with, with a, a tau, you, you know immediately what that formula has to be. It's, it's the stock divided by that thing. And the other one has to be the reciprocal of that. And look, these are just two different faces of the same thing. These are two different sides of the coin, as it were. Um, so tau is, is just one over alpha. And alpha is one over tau. So if I give you something that you have a probability 0 0.01 per year of dying, what's the average amount of time before you die? It's one over 0 0.01 or 100 years. Um, so one is ju just the reciprocal of the other. It, it, it follows through and it works out mathematically in a set of slides that I provided you some weeks ago. Um, so you don't have to know the derivation, but you got to know this relationship. Um, and similarly, if you have uh, if you have a tau and you want to calculate an alpha in terms of it, it's one over it, and it's got to be the case. I mean, it's just in one case you divide by one for death, the other you multiply by one. One's got to be one over the other, right? Um, if you, if you think about it, anyway. First order delays, you should be comfortable with that. Now we still haven't gotten to the issue though of um, with either of these, of uh, what's the equilibrium value of the stock. The, equil the equilibrium value of the flow, of the outflow is always equal to the value of the inflow. Hmm, plain and simple. Um, the equilibrium value of the stock is the value of the stock that is such that it induces that it causes that value for the outflow. So look, the stock at equilibrium has to have a value that jibes with the value of the outflow that's consistent with it, gives rise to that outflow. Remember, flows depend on their values for stocks. So death, its value, the value of death, like 20 per, per year, that just depends on the value of the population. So the question is, if this system's in balance, if we have immigration per year of 20 people per year, and therefore to be in balance, death has to be 20 people per year, that's system in balance. And then the question is what value of population will give rise to that death? Well, like death is equal to population divided by tau. So the value of the population that will give rise to 20 people per year dying is gonna be 20 times tau, right? Uh, this could be the value of this times tau. That's the value of the, of the stock. Why is that? Because if the stock has value 20, 20 times tau and you divide by tau to get death, you get 20. So it's, it, it all hangs together. Um, it's gotta be the population of the stock uh, that, that drives that outflow. If you phrase it the other way, look, if you phrase it with alpha, um, it's just the flip of it, right? It's 
the, the value of the, so death is equal to population times alpha, times alpha instead of divided by alpha, instead of divided by tau, it's times alpha. So death is population times alpha. Great. So if death has to equal 20, what value of the population will give us, you know, that, that value of, of, of death, right? You can solve for it as a little algebraic uh, problem. And the answer is it's 20 divided by alpha. Remember, tau is just one over alpha. Alpha is just one over tau. So you can always, if you can figure out one, you can figure out the other. So the equilibrium value of the stock here is 20 times tau. The equilibrium value of the stock here is 20 divided by alpha. Same, same thing, just the flip side of the coin. Okay, so you gotta be solid on that. That's the value of the stock. The value of the stock at equilibrium is such that it gives rise to an outflow that outflows such that the system's in equilibrium. And you could solve it with a little algebra. You could solve it using these, these heuristics. Hope that's uh, helpful. This is for a, a first order delay with a single outflow, I should emphasize. Um, okay, and you should have good intuition for what's going on here. Look, if inflow is greater than outflow, the stock's gonna rise. If it's less than inflow, the stock's gonna fall. These things are really important. Um, there is a feedback here. The feedback involves, you know, as population is greater, the more deaths per unit time, which drives the population lower. So it pushes back against that original change. It's a negative feedback and it kind of comes out with the flow and, and or it comes out with, sorry, with this uh, sort of arcing blue, blue uh, arrow indicating a dependency. And then the other side of the loop is kind of upwards against the flow, sucking things out of the, the, the population. Okay. Um, those are first order delays. You gotta be uh, very uh, comfortable with that. Now in the area of, of competing risks, I thought that I had, uh, yeah, um, competing risks. I'll, I'll just jump onto that. And really this should be uh, a few slides earlier before I started to get into mention. So in fact, I think I'm going to, to do that here. Um, after all, I am still on my holiday. So I, I have a certain amount of latitude in what I do. Um, okay, there we go. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, so um, competing risks. Here we have a situation where we have a stock that's drained by more than one flow. And the key thing is to realize that this changes the mathematics of the situation some. Um, it's no longer the case despite the names here, that it's, it's no longer the case that the, um, the mean time proceeding along, excuse me, along this flow, for example, um, diabetics proceeding to end-stage renal disease is just given by this mean time to develop it and where the formula for this flow is the stock divided by that. Um, this would be if there were no mortality, but given the fact there's this competing risk, it's actually the, the average time it takes to go down this flow to this population with end stage renal disease will be different depending on what this other flow is. So there's kind of this competition between the flows and that it induces changes to the, um, uh, to the, to the statistics, including the mean time to proceed. Now, I don't expect you to memorize the formulas for this, but I sure expect you to, to have that intuition. And, and, you know, look, if we were to double the diabetic mortality rate, what it's going to do is, is it's going to affect um, how many people die before getting end stage renal disease and when those people who do develop end stage renal disease. Um, will develop it. In other words, it's gonna affect these people going down here. Um, the only people that make it out of their end stage renal disease before dying are ones who do it soon. Otherwise the, the deaths will be draining it. Suppose deaths, uh, the annual risk of diabetic mortality is really, really high. Um, they got a light out of there to, to, this, uh, to this state here, to this other stock, uh, or else they're gonna be 
they're going to die first. So it, it skews it towards people who leave early. And if you look at it like uh, doubling this, th this risk here is going to actually skew it so that more people leave earlier or of the people who make a tend to renal disease, they're the people who leave earlier. The people who would have made it later die first um, via, via those other causes, that other flow. So um, the mean time to develop end stage renal disease is actually skewed by the presence of this other flow. That's the thing to know, okay? That competing flows induce changes in the the statistics involved in the other flows, um, even though they don't directly specify anything with respect to those other flows, they induce um, dynamics that are relevant to those uh, other other flows. And I won't, you know, dwell on this longer. If there's questions about it later, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah. Another another important point, ladies and gentlemen. I, I've made this point and a number of informal in a number of informal comments but I, I want to kind of make sure it really sinks in the system that you're at system that you are currently seeing on the screen um, is a memoryless system and what I mean by that is that, the chance of leaving per unit time down any, this flow, or for that matter, if we had had two flows, probably per unit time of leaving via those flows is independent of how long somebody has been in the stock. That probability per unit time of leaving via flow could change over time. There's no problem with that. Remember in a infectious disease model where you might be going from susceptible to infective, you bet it changes over time. The force of infection, the probability per unit time of getting infected of a susceptible is gonna change over time. And none of this is contradicting that. What it's saying is that a given person in this diabetic population stock is subject to that same risk, regardless of how long they've been in the stock. If they came in a femtosecond again, they came in yesterday, they came in a year ago, it doesn't care. They're all sort of an undifferentiated mix within the diabetic population stock, okay? They're just, they're, they're just intermixed. It's well mixed as a stock. And this is um, an important point because, uh, you know, there's a lot of proceeds in the world that are not memoryless, where we, we, we definitely don't want the same risk to, to apply to someone who's, for example, maybe, maybe this one could be critiqued. Maybe we want to say, well, wait a minute. I mean, someone's chance of, of developing end-stage renal disease with diabetes is not the same, you know, the day after they develop diabetes and what it is 10 years from then or 20 years from then. It's probably much greater later. Um, that's when the damage is being been done to the body and and there's a greater chance your kidney will give out so you know dealing with a single stock you got to realize it's it's memoryless it doesn't care how long people have been in there so what we put together is these things called it's kind of a it's kind of an abuse of the term but it, aging chains okay or higher order delays is, is a less kind of um uh, has less baggage associated with it. Aging chains have a series of stocks in a row. Um, and that system is definitely not memoryless. It's memory full, as it were. It has, uh, it carries memory. Um, you're much more likely to be in the first stock early on, and then much more likely to be in the next stock a bit later, and then, you know, more likely to be in a later stock later yet. Um, and your chance of leaving the whole system is going to be quite dependent on how long you've been in that system. Uh, and you'll see it on sort of the, the graphs of, of, you know, how long people spend in that system. Um, okay. Um, so, 
uh, just be aware this is memoryless, and it's not true. It's not true that all system dynamic diagrams are memoryless. No, 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 no. I mean, we we string them together in these higher level constructs like higher order delays to make them um, memoryful. Okay, and we consider that system as a whole. It's just a stock by itself is not memoryless. I will note that when it comes to agent-based modeling, for example, um, uh, there's no such restriction. You can have a, but you, you might be excused for thinking that there's kind of this isomorphism uh, on first appearances between uh, the, the phasing of the stocks on the one hand and the corresponding state, state diagram, state charts. But um, that only goes so far. And, and one point is that you can easily have a state and a state chart, which has a memory full transition. For example, in any logic, there's this built in support for a set of different semantics, right? For outgoing. One of them is timeout transition. You leave after some amount of fixed amount of time. Doesn't have to be a, a fixed constant that you know is a literal number i mean you could could upon your entry to the stock you can draw it from a distribution but the point is you leave after exactly that time that's not memory less that's memory full i mean it's about as full of memory as you can get it I, I, whether you leave in a given time unit ne next little bit of time depends entirely on how long you've been there that's what it's defined around that's what it's defining feature um, but you also have, of course, uh, rate transitions, which are going to be independent of how long you've been in there. But it's not the only um, game in town for agent-based modeling. We have much greater repertoire and flexibility. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just comment if we are comparing agent-based modeling and, and system dynamics modeling. Um, this this apparent isomorphism I mentioned between, you know, you have a system dynamics diagram, it's maybe SIR, and you have a agent-based model with state charts, SIR. It, it looks like just, you know, half dozen one, six of the other. I mean, it looks looks like basically the same thing. No, no, no. I mean, it, it, there's a lot more going on under the, the covers. And one of these things is this issue of you're forced into those stocks being memoryless individually within um, a system dynamics articulation. That's not true in agent-based modeling. But more than that, if you have multiple lines of progression, I, I emphasized this before, but if you want it in some pop quizzes, but if you want it to, you want to have progression along, let's say flu, um, stages of flu, susceptible for flu, exposed for flu, infected for flu, recovered for flu, and and SEIR for COVID-19 and maybe some asymptomatic states or oligosymptomatic states in there as well for good measure. If you wanted that with a system dynamics diagram, really what you're forced to do is deal with all possible combinations of them. Susceptible for flu, susceptible for COVID, exposed for flu, susceptible to COVID, and then just all possible uh, combinations of them, which is combinatorially really nasty. So if you have you know, four states for flu and 10 for COVID, you got 40 states you got to deal with, four times 10, right? Um, whereas if you have them in state charts, you can factor them out. A person, a given person will be in exactly one state for COVID-19 at a given time and exactly one state for flu, uh, but we don't have to have a state in our state chart, any state charts, which is for all possible combinations. No, 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 you can keep track of, of them separately, just like a, a variable could keep track of what the value is for that and another variable of this other one, for example. So, so that's a, another difference between state charts and stock and flow diagrams you should be aware of. Um, because uh, at first glance, they look uh, very different and then they look very, very similar and then they look different. Reminds me of a Zen koan. Um, so uh, you got to recognize um, you got to recognize that there's uh, more to meet the eye 
uh, than their immediate um, being just different phrasings of the same thing. It, it goes deeper than that. Okay. Um, okay, people are still arriving and I'm trying to admit them as soon as they arrive here. Um, okay, uh, keeping track of time. Let's move on to the second major topic. Um, and this topic spans three major different sort of approaches to it um, or relevant sets of material. And it's the topic of dimensions, okay? And um, two of these are quite close cousins. The third is, is actually using the term dimension in, in a somewhat different sense. And there's some distant sort of relevant, uh, some distant mapping between them, but it's not it's not something which is uh, uh, immediate, um, like it is for the for the later one. Um, so the first of these is kind of the the one that doesn't look like the other two, and that has to do with this notion of of dimensional analysis and dimensions and units. And uh, I referred to a dimensional argument just a few minutes ago about a system like this, where this is dimension time, population is of dimension population, and therefore death has to be, well, any flow from a stock has to be of dimension, dimension of the stock, you know, divided by time. Um, and uh, dimensions in general describe kind of the semantic category associated with a reference. So you can have people, you can have time, you could have length, you could have area, or or length times length. Um, and there's this whole unit system associated with it, which you know, might remind you a bit of types within programming languages, and if so, for good reason. Uh, there's this algebra associated with, with dimensions. Um, and uh, this isn't really something you, you need to carry away with, but you should have seen a video on this and um, that explicates this much more, but within a dimension, we might have multiple units, right? So we might measure, measure length in uh, feet, in meters, in centimeters, in angstroms, in fathoms, in furlongs, you know, uh, any number of different uh, ways, different yardsticks, different, different ways of measuring things, but but fundamentally, they're all an aspect of, of uh, the dimension of length. And we can convert from one to the other numerically. But what, what we're really banking on here is this notion of dimension, OK? Um, I'm not going to be asking you questions about, about units specifically. But you should know how to take a model like this and, and associate dimensions, with it, uh, specify a dimension for everything in this, in this model. Uh, unambiguously, um, and uh, doing so confers a number of benefits. And I had hoped that I would have those benefits uh, enumerated, but I, I see that uh, I've shortchanged them. So let me uh, specify the way, some of the major ways that it's useful. Okay, number one, um, it, and you can go back and look at that video, for, for more edification on this. Uh, number one, uh, dimensions allow us to identify errors in our model. Um, they allow us to identify things where we're doing something absolutely silly, like we're adding a people per unit time to people, which is semantically meaningless. It may be numerically possible, but it's, it, it means nothing. It's full of sound and fury, and it signifies nothing of significance. Um, it may suggest, may identify that we're adding dollars to people um, as if we could add $2 to three people in some meaningful way, which we can't. So, so it can help us spot errors, okay, in our diagrams. Another way that it helps is by leading us to identify necessary formulas. I kind of went through that argument earlier here where I said, you know, that the necessary formula for death has to be population divided by mean lifetime. I mean, it's no two ways about it. It's, it's just got to be that, that linear relationship. Um, 
so it can sort of constrain our understanding. Another way it can help is actually a very germane for modeling, which is by systematically going through and um, enumerating the dimensions associated with our model, we can go through a process called de-dimensionalization of the model, where essentially we convert all our parameters into things of unit dimension. Now, unit dimension is a special type of quantity. Something of unit dimension is something that doesn't depend on units. Okay, um, now forgive the term. It's also, when I say unit dimension, I'm, I mean dimension one is another name for it. Another name for it is dimension less, although it's kind of a poor name because it, just like saying something of length zero is lengthless. No, it has a length. It, has, it just happens to be zero, but we sometimes, very commonly, people refer to dimensionless quantities, meaning quantities that are independent of, of their units. And I gave an example earlier, the fraction of this, of this uh, room that's covered by furniture. That's dimensions. It's, it's of unit dimension. Another thing is a fraction of coin flips that turn out heads. Um, that's also dimensionless quantity. Um, Fractions generally tend to be because we have same units in the numerator and denominator and it cancels. Um, so when we when we go and de-dimensionalize a model and, and identify dimensionless um, or unit dimension um, values for all the parameters, what that allows us to actually do is deal with fewer parameters. Um, we can actually express precisely the same model with fewer parameters. And it, it reflects the fact that, that models that are meaningful, models that are, have, have significance, are, are, that are plausible for characterizing the world have to be dimensionally homogenous, have to be dimensionally consistent. And that really shrinks the set of possible models hugely. Instead of dealing with all possible models, all sort of weird, funky equations, it, it really constrains what are the possible models that hold water that, that, are, that are meaningful, that could possibly be characterizations of something in the world in some meaningful way. It allows us to throw out the rest. And, and it turns out that one of the nice benefits of this is you can express the same model with a lot fewer parameters. Um, it's like compressing. Uh, compressing it or something. Um, and uh, we throw away redundant information. We get down to the, the essence of it, uh, which requires fewer parameters. And that's really useful because when it comes to cal uh, calibrating a model, we can do so with fewer parameters. When it comes to, to doing sensitivity analysis in that model, we can we can do so with fewer parameters. When it comes to parameter estimation, you know, looking things up in the literature or whatever, we can do so with fewer parameters. And that's very, very practical and useful. Another thing we can do is create scale models. Like we could take an ABM and create a scaled down version of it. So instead of simulating Canada's, you know, 30 million people or the United States 320 million, we can simulate a, a subset of a million. And and have a principled relationship to the to the full set um, to to understand how it would scale the results for that scale down model would scale to the full size system, just like engineers build small bridges and reason about the loading of the bridge at what point it collapses or what point it starts to flap around in the wind, um, in a wind tunnel. And they can reason rigorously about what that would mean about a full size structure like the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Tacoma, Washington, Galloping Gertie. You can go look it up. Um, some interesting videos of it. Um, so, uh, so, what I'm trying to say here is that um, the, the presence of dimensional information uh, carries profound value, allows us to spot errors helps us give hints for formulating a model, allows us to deal with fewer parameters through uh, dimensional analysis. We can, we can um, de-dimensionalize a model 
and allows us to build scale models. All of those are potent uh, advantages of maintaining dimensional information. Um, they give you benefit early and they give you benefit often in terms of these uh, successive, uh, successive values. This, this slide is really a, a non sequitur for the, for the uh, sake of the event. Um, okay, so um, that's uh, this notion of dimension. Um, I'd like to talk about two other notions of dimension though that are, that are important. And those are in a later slide of, uh, of this presentation. Um, yeah. Okay, so, so both of them really come in in this context of state space methods. State space is kind of this useful lens state space diagrams and a state space perspective are kind of, they offer useful lenses to understand these phenomena that apply to both the other dimension, both the other notions of dimension when it comes to dynamic model. Okay, so um, in the area of state space methods, you should be comfortable with, um, with this lens. You should be comfortable with, with looking at a diagram and, and having a sense of what it means. And we talked about that a bit in our time last time, right? If you took a marble and you were to roll it, um, it would roll down and you know approach this, uh, this equilibrium point. An equilibrium point in these flow lines is a point where you know, the flow lines are of zero length, basically. It, it sort of, um, it ain't going, going anywhere from, from that point. Um, and uh, there's essentially, it, it reaches this point where it's in balance. It's neither going up on one axis nor going elsewhere on the other axis. This tells us, you know, how one stock, the X stock, say P, uh, and the other stock, perceive P, change. So for here, you know, uh, perceive P is rising very quickly and P is only slowly going down compared to that. But then P starts dropping really quickly and perceived P is not really going anywhere very fast. And then we start going down in both perceived P and in P, et cetera. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, these, these uh, state space diagrams should be familiar to you. Trajectories, uh, are from like a single run of the simulation model, you should be able to recognize it's just gonna follow those flow lines and arc out, whoa, arc out this kind of um, path through these uh, flow lines that, that it's gonna represent its progression over time, okay? And it abstracts away from exactly where it is at what point in time. And it just tells you, you know, how it's going, what are the values of the stocks uh, through which it's traversing. So at this point, for example, at a certain value P and a certain value for C P proceeds along and now it's a different, and now at this time, whatever time that was, at it's value P and a different value for C P, et cetera. Um, so the, the axes here, there's one axis for each state variable of this model here, P and for C P, each stock. Okay. Um, so uh, we talked, fixed points are these crit, are also called critical points or equilibria. They're at certain points where it's no longer changing. Um, basins of attraction have to deal with um, the fact that we have these different catchment areas that kind of, they will often have attractors in them, these equilibria that like this one or like this one, wanna sort of suck things in towards them, at least in certain dimensions. Um, and, and within this context, you can have this kind of tipping points between these basins where, you know, if, if we're, we start here, we get sucked down to, to this point here. By contrast, if we get sucked you know, start just a little bit higher up. It's kind of being on the other side of the ridge. You know, maybe it's just a hundred meters away on the other side of the ridge. If we drop a marble there, it's gonna go down towards the Pacific and, and shoot down there towards some other equilibrium. So these are 
these are these so-called basins of attraction and they suck things in towards them. And at a practical level, those are associated, for example, with different uh, endemic equilibria. Um, you know, in the case of COVID-19, this is a very troubling prospect, but a very real one. Um, countries like New Zealand and Australia have essentially driven it extinct. I might note that uh, China, uh, Taiwan, uh, also uh, led them in, in this regard very early on and kind of showed viable ways of, of, uh, of basically keeping a lid in it, keeps it at its disease-free equilibrium um, and kept it stable when there were outbreaks. Uh, by contrast, uh, there may be, you know, an emerging endemic equilibrium here in Canada where you get periodic winter outbreaks of COVID-19, not unlike flu outbreaks, and where we're always you know, trying to catch up to that, trying to get the next vaccines ready because of the mutations of the virus worldwide. Uh, we look at what's going on in Southern Hemisphere and use that to create the vaccines for the next year. That's probably the future for which we're going. But you could imagine a situation where it's at an entirely different level yet, and we're just constantly fighting outbreaks throughout the year, uh, you know, that are that are much worse than that. And uh, in that case, there might be two endemic equilibriums: one where the healthcare system is just overwhelmed, it can't keep up, and it's very high level rates of incidence. Another, and high rates of mutation and high rates of new variants that are vaccine and, and immunity resistant, and it just keeps on keeps on going at very high rates. So you might have two endemic equilibria that are possible, um, each associated with a basin of attraction. And that's what you can get, particularly when these cases of overloaded healthcare systems. Um, okay, now uh, within this context though of state, state space diagrams, uh, we have a notion of dimensionality that comes up again. And there's two, two notions I wanna talk about. One is, one is that's kind of induced by the structure of the model, okay? By conservation properties or by uh, the fam famous, uh, uh, famous mathematician, Emmy Noether, um, who, uh, who laid down what's now called uh, Noether, Noether's theorem. Um, you have symmetries and conservations, which are kind of the same, uh, same sides, uh, same, two different sides of the same coin. Uh, and which basically limit the number of actual dimensions that are at issue. So nominally here, looked at naively, we have three stocks and therefore in a state space diagram, we need three dimensions for that. We have to summarize the number of people in I, number of people in, uh, in, in S and number of people in T to completely describe the system. And what she noted instead is that, look, um, uh, you know, when, when we have conservations here, we also have, there's induced symmetries associated with it. And what they can combine to yield in this case is something where, in fact, the dimensionality of the system is less than you think. Nominally, we think it's SI and TI1 for this temporarily immune state also. But if you realize, wait a minute, there's a conservation of people here. If they're not in S and I, they're in TI1. Uh, if they're not in TI1, they're in either S and and I, we don't need to specify all three stocks. If we know the value of the number of people in the system as a whole, uh, that's just some constant. All we have to do is specify two stock values, say S and I, pick those as our point of reference, and we can figure out the remaining information. We don't need another number to specify it. It's totally given by the values of S and I. And in that case, what seems like a three-dimensional system can in fact be two dimensions, for example, here, because it has only these two degrees of freedom. There's this conservation or symmetry associated with the system, which induces these, these, uh, um, this smaller dimensionality. So this is something we thought was dimensionality three. It had it was something that was going in, in uh, three dimensions here, uh, traversing S, I, and TI1. But in fact, it, if you look under, you know, closer, it has only two effective dimensions. 
the third is just a linear combination of the others. And so you could plot it on a flat surface. You don't need a 3D, 3D space to draw it out. If you look at it from the right angle, it's just a, it's just playing out along a plane, which indicates really there's only two dimensions associated with it. It's kind of one along here and then one kind of in and out of the page. Um, okay, so that's, that's a second notion of dimension, dimensionality of this system. You would think this system might have three dimensions, but it actually only has two because, because of these, these conservation properties, um, uh, these degrees of freedom. But there's another notion too associated with this distinction between nominal dimensionality and intrinsic dimensionality that's kind of more interesting and deeper. Um, and in a way, it, it reflects some of the same, um, same realizations uh, that, uh, I mean, Arthur's uh, theorem pointed to 100 years ago, uh, but did so, does so at a, at a level that um, is sometimes more, uh, more subtle because they're, they're implicit. Um, they don't stand out and, and hit you. Um, so here, we make it essentially a nominal dimensionality, which is the apparent dimensionality if you consider the system as a whole, and the intrinsic dimensionality, which is how much of that it really exercises. And the observation is that in a system, con consider an agent-based model. That is a huge dimensionality of state space. Uh, I argued last time from this very floor um, in our first uh, exam review session that if you have n people and agents and each of them can be, for example, in two possible states, you know, they can be sick or not sick, afflicted or not afflicted, let's say, okay? Um, two possible states. Then the number of states the whole system could be in is two to the n. Um, it's like for each person, there's a bit, zero or one. And you have to string out all the bits, all n of the bits, one for each person, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, et cetera. You write those all out and there's two to the n possible bit sequences, right? Um, so in principle, you could have, it could be in any of two to the n states. But if this is a transmissible infection, um, there's a lot of coupling going on there. There's a lot of interaction between those people. And if Sam's infected and Mary's infected, and they're both, both uh, you know, good friends with Sue, um, if they are in the same apartment together, probably Sue will be infected too. And so you actually have the exercise degrees of freedom. In theory, it could be that you know uh, you have any possible state, but in, in fact it it tends to hew quite closely to, to, to a, a, a defined set of paths. And if you, um, if you look a little bit more deeply at it, um, what you can find is that a system that is nominally, maybe two to the n, um, two to the n size, if you actually plot out what's going on in like uh, three dimensions for an ABM, this might have a thousand people in it. Each of them can be in four possible states, but the actual state of the ABM only exercises a small subset of that because of how the infection spreads, et cetera. And the intrinsic dimensionality, the sort of how much is actually occupied is a lot less. It's a bit like, you know, the sheet of paper, right? I mean, a sheet of paper is in three space. It's in three dimensions. Um, you know, uh, X, Y, Z, but it's, it's intrinsically two-dimensional space within that. It only, only sort of extends over really two dimensions and it's kind of bent and so on, but it's, it's only extending over two dimensions. And if you plot out an ABM, um, its behavior, it tends to actually have a lot of low dimensional features to it. I'm glossing over a lot of things, perhaps most notably the presence of stochastics, but you know, the structure of the ABM will really induce often big differences 
in the structure of the state space. Um, it'll have kind of different uh, dimensionality associated with it. Now, the thing that I want you to remember though, is I'm, I'm bringing this back to a point that I made in, uh, in a lecture, which has to do with this notion of delay embedding. And the idea here is, look, we have data from the world. Let's put aside models for the second. Data from the world. We have a time series. Um, why, you know, of observations, why? Maybe it's the number of hospitalizations on a per day basis of, with COVID-19 over time. Um, and uh, maybe we have it for 400 data points um, for Saskatchewan. <clears throat> so uh, if we have a time series like that, um, that time series <clears throat> is gonna be reflective of a lot of things it's going to be reflective of the number of people infected out there. But the number of people infected out there in the population uh, is also going to depend itself on things. Uh, so if, if we're getting hospitalizations, uh, that's also going to depend, for example, on how much transmission is going on uh, or how many people that, that have already been hospitalized and therefore are not subject to hospitalization again, or God forbid, have died. And, you know, all of these mean that this time series can packs together information about the broader system. It kind of whispers to us not only about one just piece of the system, but the tangled components all throughout the system. And we can go through this mechanical process, and it's a mechanical process of undergoing what's called delay embedding. From a one time series, we can take each point in the time series, call it y of t, and we can construct a vector. Maybe it's a three-dimensional vector, for example. So n, let's call it three here. Um, and uh, actually, this, this should be n minus one then. Um, but uh, each, each of these, uh, for each point in the original time series called y of t, we'll, we'll create a three-dimensional vector, okay? Um, so one of those three-dimensional vectors will be y of t, y of t minus some tau, and y of t minus two times that tau. So maybe it's y of t, y of t minus one, and y of t minus two. Um, and that's a vector, and it's a direct vector in three space. Um, it's a three-dimensional vector. It has three elements in it. And I might do that for t equals 100, t equals 101, t equals 102, t equals 103. For each of those, I get a three-dimensional vector. Um, and this may seem like a bizarre notion, but it turns out mathematically, you can prove that if you do this, you go through this so-called delay embedding, you can get out something that is really useful. These vectors, these gobs of three-dimensional vectors you get out, right? Pretty much one for every time point, except for kind of the ends, which don't have previous data points. Um, uh, it turns out that that information, those vectors you get out are really super useful. And specifically, they correspond to, they directly reflect the state space of the underlying system that gave rise to this data. So those vectors are kind of telling you what the structure of the state space is that gave rise to this data, the, the, of the things driving the, the, data, the um, time series that, that you saw, which is often much of a system. So what you can do here is you can use it to assess the dimensionality of the system. Um, you can use it to, to formally estimate that dimensionality and, and know how complicated a model we need to explain it, for example. And it turns out you can assess the causal structure, what's driving what within that system. And just to give you an idea from this, so here we have a three-dimensional system, okay? We have a three-dimensional dynamical system. It has X, Y, and Z dimensions. Those are each variables. But given just data from X, we can actually reconstruct the system as a whole, the underlying elements of the system 
can be reconstructed. We can reconstruct the state space of the system um, through any data from any one element of the system. And that's really useful because data from, from hospitalizations alone would whisper to you of data about the number of cases that are not hospitalized, whisper to you information about the number of deaths, whisper to you information about the number of tests, et cetera. Um, so when we do this, when we go through this delay embedding, and you should know how to go through delay embedding um, of a time series, you can get out um, you can, you can get out this kind of facsimile, this, this thing that's very similar to the state space of the entire system. And uh, that turns out to be quite useful for our modeling and for uh, assessing dimensionality. So we can kind of use it to scrutinize whether our model structure is capturing the essential features, maybe lead us to prefer one model structure to another, for example. Um, and, and rule out certain types of models that we might otherwise use. Or maybe tell us we need a model that's got additional stocks beyond the SIR model, which we've been using, et cetera. So these things are useful. And these things are things about the world. They whisper to us about what's going on in the world in ways that are not obvious just from looking at the time series. And we achieve that through this delay embedding, okay? So you should know that this process exists. It can confer these benefits and basically uh, how it takes place mechanically. Okay, um, so those are my comments on some neglected areas of this, um, of this review from last time. Uh, to wit, I was talking about aspects associated with um, with first order delays, with uh, aging chains, with uh, the competing risks. And uh, I also spoke about, you know, the fact that negative feedbacks um, are associated with, uh, are associated with oscillations if you have a long delay involved in them. So uh, that was the first part. And then we went on to three notions of dimensionality. Notion one, uh, di dimensional structure, keeping track of dimensional structure. Uh, number two, um, speaking about kind of number of degrees of freedom of a system and, and um, the fact that dimensions mean the number of points of data we need to fully specify a system. And sometimes because of conservation properties or symmetries, we, we don't have to specify as many because we know, for example, the stocks have to total up to the same value regardless where, where people are right now. Um, the total population is the same. Um, and we talked about dimensionality just now in terms of uh, intrinsic versus nominal dimensionality. Uh, dealing with um, how many degrees of freedom is it really exercising? Is it, does it really exercise all two to the n uh, types of degrees of freedom or is it um, actually exercising a lot fewer because things are so coupled together? And we saw it just there uh, embedding, which, um, uh, which is this process by which we can get hints as to the dimensionality of a system. It's a mechanical process undertaken on observed data that can whisper to us about what sort of models we need to study the system that gave rise to that data appropriately. So um, those were some uh, material that I didn't emphasize that you know it's worth you knowing about. So uh, we are um, a bit early. We're 18 minutes before the hour. So I will now open the floor to questions uh, from those assembled. So if you'd like to use the chat to put forward your name, um, I can call on, on them in that order.
yeah. Would I have time to go over high order delays? Yes, I could go over high order delays. Um, so uh, that's a good question. Um, it is uh, worthy material. Uh, and let me just see if I can, ah, okay. I happen to have up a set of slides um, that uh, I think include some materials. Yes, yes, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, uh, responsive uh, to the Jalanian question. Okay, um, so let's just, um, I'm, I'm just kind of zeroing in on the exact scope to give. Okay, so I'm going to switch back uh, to my, um, uh, to my slides here, and uh, I will show this. Uh, here we go. Boom. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, right. Um, higher order delays uh, consist essentially of um, sequences. Uh, strung together successively, uh, first order delays. So we might have, for example, a stage one, that's a first order delay and a stage two, that's a first order delay and we compose them by having the outflow of the first stage enter into the inflow of the second stage, right? And it serves as the inflow. Um, and what I show in, in this uh, diagram is um, a useful construct where essentially we, to kind of compare apples to apples with these delays, we're going to consider a first order delay as just by it by itself um, um, as having an inflow and outflow. And we'll have some mean time to transition across all stages, which is just one, one stage there um, associated with it. Um, and then uh, as we add in new stages, we're going to keep the retain invariant the time it takes to go across all of them. And what that means, each one will, will be on each of these stocks only for a fraction of that time. So if we have uh, two stages, uh, stage one will be in for half the mean time to transition across all stages and stage two will be in for half that mean time to transition across all stages. Um, so we kind of have a formula here that divides mean time to transition across all stages by the number of stages to give a main, uh, mean time to transition across a single stage. And as we add in stages, we'll retain constant this value, even though and we'll we'll do so by having each stage, you know, be transitioned across quicker and quicker. So if we have a thousand stages, each of them you'll go across quite quickly compared to if you only have one stage. Um, so if you if you kind of look at this, um, you know, first order delay leads to something like this, where if we consider the outflow of the whole system, which is just stage one here, um, it it declines immediately. So, you know, if you're coming in here, um, immediately people start coming out because um, it's memoryless. It doesn't care how long people have been there. And so people, as long as there's people here, people will start coming out there. Now, if we start to consider stage two outflow by contrast, almost no one, people may enter in here immediately but no one's going to be leaving here immediately in any number. And so, you know, they're going to be here for a bit and some are going to transition here after some time, but very, very few will transition out. But in time, in the fullness of time, people will enter into this stage more and more and then flow out. So you get something like this. Um, so the stage two outflow is initially essentially zero and then it rises and then it declines there. Um, and this is reflective of a quite different distribution than this, right? Here, the time where, the single time where there's most people coming out per unit time is the beginning. 
Here, it's not the beginning. It's, it's later, right? Um, uh, and uh, this is um, this is a value uh, here of, of 50. Uh, this actually has a uh, an outflow such that you have, and I'd have to check if this is uh, 50, but um, this looks to me a little bit suspicious. I think uh, it, it may be 20 though. Now here's a third order delay. Uh, so we have three stages um, in succession, and they're just three, you know, three first order delays um, placed uh, head to head, as it were, or placed, uh, you know, in succession, right? Um, and uh, we have uh, for the um, for the outflow from that sort of delay, we have a uh, a thing which at first starts rising just like this one, but it starts rising actually a little bit slowly. You'll notice it kind of takes time to ramp up in the third order delay. Um, and that's because as soon as people come in here, it's not that people start coming into stage three. No, they don't leave it, but they don't even come into it because they've got to go to stage two. Whereas in a two stage one, as soon as people come in here, some of them are going to stage two. And so it starts rising really, really quickly. And so these delays can be described with what's called an Erlang distribution. This is what's called an exponential distribution associated with how long you spend here. Each person will spend an exponentially distributed time. It's it just like we draw sometimes from normal distributions in other contexts here, we draw it from an exponential distribution. And, you know, the single point they're most likely to spend there is points very closely close to zero, whereas it's quite different for this one or third order uh, delay, quite different. And in general, it, these are described what are called Erlang distributions. Um, uh, so, you know, the mean time to depart the final stage is just k times the mean time for for a single stage. Um, and where this goes to ultimately is an infinite order delay. You'll notice as you add stages, it becomes more and more concentrated um, around the mean. And as you add more and more, this is only up to six order. If you go to 10, you go to 100, you go to 1,000, you go to 10,000, it's going to become more and more peaked, more and more peaked, and more and more narrow. And it will approach what's called a Dirac delta function, which is this kind of impulse function um, and it will uh, it'll sort of be centered it'll go basically you'll you'll uh, leave after exactly that that amount of time um, so anyway I hope that's uh, helpful and uh, this is is something which is you know more uh, intensive it's unlikely that I will be uh, testing these sort of level of details, but it's a good thing to know. And what's really good to know is that this is not a memoryless system. This is a memory full system. You, you can just see it. It's, you know, um, how, if you have people pouring into your immediately, they're not going to leave immediately. They're going to be, um, it's going to depend how many people come out of this system it's going to depend very much on how long they've been in the system. Um, it's not independent of it. Whereas this is a memoryless system of Wizard with a single stage. This is a memoryless system. Anyway, those are some comments on higher order delays. Uh, additional questions? I'll again monitor the chat. Will there be any calculation questions? Um, good question. There won't be questions that require use of a numeric calculator. There will be questions, I can assure you, which involve some algebra. Um, I would strongly, to, to, to get to your more substantive next question though, um, 
uh, should you have pen and pencil handy? Yeah, we actually handle. So the last two times I've given this course, we've actually delivered the exam via Moodle as this exam will be delivered. Uh, and we've actually handed out scratch paper to people um, to use to, to, to work through algebra. And I would strongly advise you to have some pen and paper uh, ready. And you could then, you know, fill it in in Moodle um, when you're when you're comfortable, uh, you know, with the, the stage of your answer and, and pr providing that. So that's a good thing to do. Um, I will note that Moodle does have some provision for including special characters and so on. And I'm going to see if I can provide some information to that. So if you want to put down Greek letters, for example, um, in the Moodle answer, uh, you can do so. Um, yeah. And, and write. Yeah. In any case, I'll, I'll, I'll provide some information on that tomorrow. Additional questions. Yeah, a uh, great question. Uh, so when I call, uh, so the question is, is a risk essentially just a rate? So when I call a hazard rate, um, I'm 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 referring to a rate. The th the thing that I'm 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 trying to um, specifically refer to is is two aspects. Okay, by referring to it that, firstly, the term rate is terribly abused. And it's abused a lot in, in in colloquial English as well as even in technical areas. So a rate is something per unit time, and sometimes we use it as like a probability per unit time. Um, in the, in which case, that's exactly what a hazard rate is. It's a probability per unit time. That's what a hazard rate means. It's it's probability per unit time, and that's a very useful construct. Whereas rate is is more general. You can talk about the rate of water flow or something, and and um, it's more general term. It's also terribly abused in talk when people talk about things like exchange rate, um, which is is not per unit time. Uh, it's a conversion between you know two currencies. Um, it's more like a coefficient. And prevalence rate is used a lot in, in the health sciences and and. You know, really good epidemiologists will often say, like, that's an abuse of the term. Do not use the term rate for prevalence rate, but it, it tends to be very widespread. And, and that's a real problem. So I tend to like to use the term hazard rate, but really it's a probability per unit of time. And in that sense, those are rates. Uh, you know, are they rates? Yeah, they're rates, they're quantities per unit time. Um, when we have a rate transition in any logic, that's a hazard rate. That's a probability per unit time. Um, when we have uh, alpha in the first order delay that, uh, you know, the formulation with alpha and we have the outflow to the first order delay being alpha times the value of the stock, that's a rate and it's, it's a hazard rate. Um, so those are all um, hazard rates. I just, I like to refer to them as hazard rate because it spe means specifically probability per unit time. Okay, not just any old rate. Sometimes people refer to the rate of people, you know, arrivals and the flow into a stock, and and there it's not clear, like people per unit time, or is it like, you know, so if you're talking about the rate of births, are you talking about the birth rate, you know, you know, uh, number of babies born per person in the population per year, or are you talk about the number of babies born in the last month, you know, some count of babies, um, that's that's. Uh, or in the past year, that's those are two rather different things, and rate is kind of, kind of sloppily used for both of those. So that's why I don't tend to like to use it as my preferred term. Okay, other questions.
maybe you folks are practicing for the exam with your silence. Um, so I don't know, I, I'll be silent. Yeah, good luck everyone. Um, I um, think, you know, you can do well if you take these uh, exam review comments to heart. I've really tried, I've striven to cover the most salient, important um, pieces of this course here. And I've tried to reflect those in the exam as well. And, you know, uh, I know there's a lot of details I didn't go into, but a lot of those details definitely are not going to be on the exam. So what I have gone into here is kind of really the core um, of what I see. And I can't promise that every, every single thing I've covered, but I think we've done a pretty good job between these two, um, two exam review sessions. So I think you'll be uh, well prepared. Okay. So I know it's been a stressful semester, a stressful year. Um, I will be with you uh, through the exam. Those who are taking it through AES, AGES, um, I will be visiting with you to answer questions as well. And I look forward to uh, seeing you tomorrow night. Um, and uh, I will be probably showing up a little bit early to the exam, just to make sure things are all set up and, and everything if, if you wanna uh, speak at all then. I'll see if I can be available for that. Thanks very much. Good luck to you and look, look forward to, uh, to seeing many of you tomorrow. Take care there.